Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of B2B Edge, a hit new TV show that some critics are saying may be the next Game of Thrones. A lot of critics have been saying that. Uh, I'm Peter of House Weinberg. This is my colleague, John. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, John Lombardo from the uh, B2B Institute. It is true, ha many critics have been saying that this is uh, one of the top didn't say it, TV shows of the upcoming saying. slate. I'm playing uh, Jon Snow in this Game of Thrones reprisal. Wonderful. Uh, so I think we're going to start off with some boring logistical details. Always a good idea. Uh, as we walk through the research, some of you might have questions. Those symptoms are perfectly normal. If you are joining through Slido, you can submit your questions on the right side of the console. If you're tuning in from LinkedIn Live, just tell us what you want to know or what you think, and uh, we'll do our best to answer a few questions at the end of the show, and we'll log on to LinkedIn afterwards to answer any questions that we miss. We will be sharing uh, the slides after the presentation, and if you want to share any of the ideas, we would love that. Feel free to use our hashtag, hashtag B2B principles. Also, don't forget to take the survey at the end of the show. We'd love your feedback. And finally, if you like what you learned today, you can download the full white paper on our beautiful website, b2binstitute.org. While you're there, we would be honored, absolutely honored, if you would consider signing up for our newsletter. And if you really just can't get enough of this sweet, sweet content, please feel free to connect with me and John on LinkedIn. We would love to hear from you. Okay, now we can get into it. Let's get into the research. Today, what we really want to talk about is growth and the B2B marketing strategies that maximize growth. Um, we're going to start off on a negative note, which is always a good idea. So I would say the marketing function is in trouble. The scope of the role has contracted from four Ps to one P, and in many B2B organizations, marketing is seen as a mere sales support function. So I think you could say that whatever we've been doing for the past decade, it hasn't really been working. And maybe now would be a good time to try something new. Maybe it's time to reevaluate the fundamental principles of marketing. John and I honestly believe that marketing is the single most important job in a business. And with the right principles in place, maybe marketers can become the growth engines of all companies. But where would we start? What might these new principles look like? Well, to answer that question, we commissioned some new research from Les Bennett, Peter Field, and the IPA. Now, some of you might be familiar with these names. The IPA is a trade organization in the UK, and it sits on top of this massive database. It's 40 years of econometric data on hundreds of brands. Les Bennett and Peter Field have spent well over a decade analyzing this data to determine what marketing strategies correlate with the most growth. And when I say growth, Keep in mind, I'm not talking about click-through rates or engagement rates. I'm talking about market share, revenue, profitability, what Bennett and Field call very large business effects. Honestly, this is some of the only research in our industry that links marketing inputs with business outputs, which is one reason why Bennett and Field's research is having a pretty massive impact all over the world. Now, historically, Bennett and Field's research hasn't distinguished between B2B and B2C marketing. Bennett and Field had never done a B2B cut of the data. Until now, until now, I am overjoyed to announce to you that we here at the B2B Institute have commissioned the first ever cut of the B2B data from Bennett and Field. This is really a seminal moment in human history, so I'm so glad you could join us. But the IPA to data isn't the only data that we're going to reference today. We're also going to leverage another type of data, a very underrated type of data called common sense, which is often in short supply these days. You're going to see about a billion charts and graphs today, but I really want to encourage you to be skeptical. Don't just trust the data. Think about the ideas, reason through the principles. And I think what you'll find is that all of these recommendations make a lot of sense even without the data. So now let's discuss the principles of growth in B2B. What we want to prove today is that the key to growth is balance. The problem with modern marketing is that it's unbalanced. We are overly invested in a narrow set of strategies, the strategies you see here in red. 
we need to consider the other side of the equation, the strategies in green. We need to achieve a better balance between long and short, reason and emotion, broad and narrow targeting. And now I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, John, who's going to walk us through the first principle. John? Well, it was both optimistic and pessimistic, your intro. That's I what we're going it. for. Balance. You know, just confuse balance. people. Balance. Reminds me of my favorite exactly. TV on the radio song, Here Comes Trouble, for marketers, though. Yeah. But the good thing is we have some, some work here to help people get out of trouble. So remember, we're talking about balance here. We're talking about short-term growth and long-term growth, and that's what the first principle covers. Now, in our opinion, this may be Bennett and Field's biggest idea, the idea that there are two types of marketing that require different approaches to creative and distribution and measurement. One of the central mental models that Bennett and Field offers is explaining that there are, in fact, two types of marketing. There's what is called sales activation and what's called brand building. Now, the first type of marketing is called sales activation. You can see a short explanation on your screen here. Sales activation specializes in delivering short-term growth. Uh, and sales activation, of course, is producing quick increases in sales or leads, right? Stuff that you get right away. However, it's important to note that those results often decay just as quickly as they arrived. And so in the end, uh, activation campaigns really don't produce long-term results. They really produce short-term results. Of course, in B2B, we generally call this type of marketing lead generation or demand generation. But that's probably not an accurate description of how this process actually works. I think one of the important things to understand is that um, sales activation doesn't create demand. It, it captures demand, but it doesn't create demand. Now, the second type of marketing is what we're calling brand building. And you can see here on the screen, brand building. Now, brand building is different. It specializes in delivering long-term growth. However, unlike sales activation, brand building not only delivers long-term growth, but also short-term growth. This represents an interesting asymmetry. Brand building delivers both short-term growth and long-term growth, though primarily long-term growth, whereas sales activation principally delivers short-term growth. I always like to say, if you were gonna do just one, I think you would do brand building because it gives you the short and the long, whereas sales activation really just gives you the short. The fundamental value of brand building really is that it reaches future buyers, creating future demand and ensuring a durable stream of future sales and profits. Because we must remember, most sales will occur well into the future. And that's why over time, brand building really, as the only type of marketing that reaches into the future, brand marketing becomes the biggest driver of business growth. Now, fortunately, you don't have to choose between brand building and sales activation. My mother always told me as a child, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Turns out in marketing, that's not true. Turns out you can have your sales activation and eat your brand building too. Wow, that's is, so catchy. It's yeah, good, right? It's like if people good. are gonna start saying that now, My mom's actually sure. watching this, so this is great. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Mom, great job. Um, and in general, what, what you naturally need to know from Ben and Field is simply that like, you do both. In fact, they've coined this idea of the 60-40 rule, which we'll get into, but sensible and profitable marketing is really about balancing short and long-term growth. I think we can all agree balance is good. Now, sales activation, as mentioned, maximizes short-term growth and brand building is long-term growth. Um, but these have to be measured and managed differently. We get into the different ways to measure and manage later in the webinar, but just keep in mind that mental model of sort of sales activation, brand building. Now, let's get to the second mental model from Bennett and Field, which is called the 60-40 rule. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the early Bennett and Field work, uh, it's a lot like Picasso's early work, and uh, they actually coined this idea of the 60-40 rule. The 60-40 rule stating that in B2C marketing, the companies which grow the fastest in the short term and the long term spend 60% of their budget on brand building and 40% of their budget on sales activation, which is what you see on the screen here. Well, as Peter mentioned, we did a cut of this data for B2B. This is the first time anybody's cut the data for B2B. And we discovered the balance is slightly different. I would call it the 50-50 rule. Now, why the difference? Well, generally speaking, sales activation is harder in B2B than it is in B2C. And of course, we see that through the length of the B2B sales cycle. If you think about the B2B sales cycle, there are dozens of touch points required to close a deal. There are many more stakeholders that are involved in that decision. And of course, there may be functional product benefits that need to com be communicated to you and your team and your bosses. To give a really simple example, of the difference between B2C and B2B, Coca-Cola doesn't need to spend time explaining the functional benefits of soda. Now, Microsoft, on the other hand, needs to put in a lot more work to close a big deal, a multi-million or multi-billion dollar IT contract. This isn't to say, by the way, that activation is more valuable. It's just to say that it requires more resources. 
Uh, there may be some small businesses and sole entrepreneurs on the phone. They'll be delighted to know that we didn't just look at the blend, is it 50-50 or 60-40? We actually looked at it by maturity of business. And what the data shows is something interesting. It shows that early growth companies often should spend more money on short-term sales activation. And they should do so for two reasons. Number one, small businesses, they've just got to make money and keep the lights on, make payroll, you know, make products. Um, that's one of the reasons, right? Just keep the lights on. Number two, it turns out there's a novelty effect at play, often for new categories and new products, where buyers will try the new product. They're attracted to the novelty. And so in some sense, early products benefit from the halo of being a new brand with novelty. However, as companies get bigger and as the novelty fades, companies must think longer term and they must invest in brand building, which critically reaches future buyers, not just current buyers. And they must use that, of course, brand building to then charge higher prices, which is another idea we talk a little bit about in the future. So ultimately, uh, this is another way to think about, you know, how to grow by size of business. Uh, a lot of mental models so far. Uh, we got another mental model for you here, uh, which is the funnel. The funnel is maybe the well, most well-known construct in marketing and certainly in B2B marketing. And it generally talks about the top of funnel and the bottom of funnel. As you can see, we just flipped the funnel. We think it's actually helpful to flip the funnel on its side and think more about growth over time. What we talk about here as short-term growth and long-term growth. Now the mental model we like isn't top of funnel and bottom of funnel, which some people ridiculously call tofu and bofu. I don't like that. I'm more of an in-market and out-of-market marketer myself. Now, why do we like this construct of in-market, out-market? We like it because we believe it's more customer-centric in two specific ways. So number one, you have to remember, your customers don't think of themselves being in the brand building phase or the sales activation phase. That's what you think of as the marketer. It's not what the customer thinks. The customer's either, I'm in market to buy something or I'm out market and I'm not gonna buy anything. So that's number one. Be more customer centric in your framing, in market, out market. Now there's a second reason that's really important as well. Marketers actually have two customers, not just the customer we just discussed, but a second customer, an internal customer. I like to call that person finance, the CFO, the person who really runs marketing. Now, we believe that in-market, out-market maps more closely to how CFOs think as well, because CFOs think of current and future cash flows. All stocks and bonds are priced by Wall Street and the markets, and what they do is they look at your cash flows over time, they discount them back to the present, and then they say, okay, they have this many cash flows in the future, so I'm going to give them the price of $140 on the market. And in fact, most of the money that underpins the current stock price, something like 80% of the cash flows that underpin your current stock price are generated 10 plus years into the future. And the only kind of market that reaches people well into the future, priming them well before they need to buy, to buy your brand, is out market. It is brand building. That's the kind of marketing that we think maps not just the way the customers think, but also ultimately the way the CFOs think. And really, if you just think about it, most of the people that buy your product over time, they exist well into the future. The people that are gonna buy this quarter, that's a small percentage of all the people that are gonna buy well into the future. Let's just give you a very crisp example. Let's say you uh, are buying a cloud computing solution. There's gonna be very few people who are gonna buy just this quarter. But if you think about the rest of the year, and then year two, year three, year four, year five, there's way more buyers in the future. So as I said, it follows that you'll wanna run brand building, which reaches a broad audience, and then gives you the profits you want durably over time. You've got to recall, of course, that these are two different types of buyers. In-market is very different from out-market, uh, and they need a very different approach when it comes to creative distribution and measurement. That's what we get to here. Now, when you're thinking about creative, if somebody's in-market, give them rational messaging, you know, 15 minutes to save 15%. Give them that rational message. However, if somebody's not in-market and won't be in-market for years, they're not going to pay attention to a rational message. They don't care about saving 15% because they're not gonna buy anything. What they want instead is a creative, entertaining, emotional story. Something like you see from Geico and all of its gecko advertising. Now, when thinking about targeting, if somebody's in market, sure, have tight targeting to people. Uh, give them a rational message. However, if somebody's out market, you don't want narrow targeting. Uh, it's just not gonna work, unfortunately. The reality is that future buyers, they could be in a different job or industry or seniority, and so if you tightly target, you will exclude them. You won't reach them. And so you want actually broader targeting when you're trying to reach future buyers with brand building. And then finally, um, you wanna think a little bit about um, sales metrics, right? And uh, sales metrics are important, right? They are ideas like cost per lead. Uh, you know, it's really coming down to a specific number. Uh, this is when you're thinking about measurements, the specific number you care about that's short term, uh, cost per lead, lifetime value. Now, when you're thinking about brand building, it's more about memory metrics well into the future. 
So you don't want to use short-term metrics to judge the financial effectiveness of long-term brand building. That's a mismatch in time horizon. It is a mismatch in customer experience. So when you're running brand campaigns to reach out market buyers, you want to use memory metrics such as brand salience, which I love, it's got a very mathematical take, which is the likelihood of a brand being thought of or noticed in a buying situation. There's just kind of like a probability to that idea that we should be using. I encourage you to read more about brand salience. It's an idea we don't cover in great depth here, but it's a fascinating and wonderful way to make your marketing more customer centric and critically more financially effective. So that is balancing long and short-term growth. Peter, what do you say about this? That was so powerful, John. Uh, I mean, when you flip the funnel like that, right? I, I couldn't believe, I could, the, the finance people, the CFOs watching, they were gasping. I could hear them from here in the studio. It's incredible. I challenge you, incredible. I challenge you to flip the funnel yourself. Yeah, okay. Can well, you do it? Yeah, I can, I can. You Spoiler sure? Spoiler alert, about to flip the funnel again. In our second principle, Fame versus awareness, which explores the balance between different brand marketing goals. What is the purpose of a brand? That's a big question in marketing today. Everybody's talking about it on the conference circuit. Let us give you our favorite answer. It's a very simple, cynical take. The purpose of a brand is to help customers make fast and easy decisions. That's it. Brands are just mental shortcuts. Whatever brand comes to mind quickly in a buying situation is the brand we choose. The technical term for this is called mental availability, defined in this lovely quotation from Professor Jenny Romaniak, one of the greatest marketing minds of our time. Highly recommend checking out some of her books. Now, most brand marketers are very focused on increasing awareness. That's the goal for most brand campaigns. But increasing mental availability is arguably a much better goal. What you really want is to be easily thought of in buying situations. You want high share of mind to own as many relevant neurons in the buyer's mind as you possibly can. So I think, honestly, marketers need to remember that the top of the funnel is not monolithic. There are many different shades of mental availability, and some are much more profitable than others. Awareness is actually the least valuable form of mental availability. If your brand has high awareness, that just means buyers know it exists. You may have heard of Taco Bell, you may know it exists, but that doesn't mean you think about Taco Bell when you're hungry, which is much more important than sheer name recognition. Salience, which John talked a little about, salience is like a level up from awareness. If your brand has high salience, that means it gets thought of easily in an actual buying situation. When you're hungry, how easily does McDonald's come to mind? And what you really want as a marketer, you want the brand to be thought of in as many different buying situations as possible. That's why if you look at McDonald's advertising, you'll see it's marketing itself as the right place to eat, whether we're talking about kids, grown-ups, burgers, chicken, breakfast, lunch, dinner. McDonald's is aiming for broad neurological coverage in all kinds of buying situations. At the very top of the funnel, there's something called fame. Fame. Famous brands have extremely high share of mind. They come to mind effortlessly. Apple, probably the most famous brand in the world. Think for a second about how much space Apple occupies in your mind, how many neurons they own. They, you know the name of all of the Apple products. You know the name of the current CEO, the past CEO, the location of the headquarters. The Apple brand is almost guaranteed to be thought of when you're buying a phone. Now, mental availability probably sounds like a very B2C idea, especially since we've been talking about McDonald's and Apple. But what the Bennett Field research shows is that mental availability is just as important in B2B as it is in B2C. Whether we're talking about sugary beverages, burgers, commercial insurance, cybersecurity consultants, the brand that comes to mind easily is the brand that gets bought. Bought, sorry. Here we've listed some of the different campaign goals in the IPA data bank. And what you'll see is that advertising designed to make a B2B brand more famous is the type of marketing that drives the most business growth. Awareness also drives growth, of course, and it's definitely better than no awareness, but awareness is not a substitute for fame. Meanwhile, interesting to note here, a lot of our clients are very focused on changing brand perceptions. But what you see here is that's about half as effective as a straight up awareness goal. 
So in general, I think B2B marketers need to worry a lot less about what buyers think about their brand and worry a lot more about when buyers think about their brand. Honestly, your primary goal, your primary goal is just to get your brand into as many consideration sets as you possibly can, which is different from trying to influence which brand gets chosen. It's just about getting considered and famous brands are always considered. Now this idea of fame, which may sound a little abstract, it actually has really big implications, especially when we're talking about creative. If the goal of your ad is just to get people thinking about your brand, then the creative canvas becomes much bigger and more interesting. Famous advertising doesn't need to make sense. It just needs to be memorable. Consider Geico, a car insurance company in the US. Now, does it make any sense for an American insurance company to have a talking Australian gecko as a mascot? Of course not. It doesn't make any sense at all. But after decades of consistent creative, does the gecko start to stick in your mind, reminding you that there is a brand called Geico and it sells car insurance? Yes. That's exactly what it does. And once you're in market for car insurance, are you going to think about Geico almost automatically? Yes, you are. The key to memorability is this idea of distinctiveness and consistency. First, your advertising has to be distinctive. In other words, it just needs to be a little weird, like the gecko. Think about people. You tend to remember weird people, like my colleague John, right? Look how weird he is, right? You're going to remember that over a bland and boring person. And really the same holds true for brands. So you need to be distinctive, you need to be weird. Your advertising also has to be consistent. What else do you remember? You remember things you've seen a billion times before, like the gecko, and that means you can't be changing your creative every quarter. Now, most B2B branding is boring and genetic. Uh, sorry, generic, not genetic. It's boring and generic. And honestly, it's a bit of a national disgrace, may even be a international disgrace. I really don't care how uninteresting your category is. If your ad is forgettable, at the end of the day, you're not doing your job. B2B marketers need to start aiming for fame. Here is a best-in-class example from HPE. In this LinkedIn ad, HPE introduces a big red IT monster that gets tamed by HPE's technology. It's a pretty bizarre video, which makes the ad hard to forget. And the IT monster is a reusable concept. They can reuse that for decades. Also, crucially, the ad creates a memorable link between HPE and the buying situation. This is what good B2B branding looks like. It's time long overdue, but it is time for B2B marketers to start betting big on bold, creative concepts like the IT monster. If you want growth, aim for fame. John, are you going to start aiming for fame? Yeah, the, the crew here told me that they can hear the people on the screen and they're all saying, aim for fame. Yeah, it's a chant. Aim it's for a chant. fame. It's a sensation. Aim for sensation. fame. That's yeah, I mean, starts. you've created an international I space. I know, all we needed to do is one little webinar and oh. we're just transforming global culture. One thing worth, incredible. worth just, I guess, one thing that I guess my mind is slightly blown by is this idea that advertising doesn't have to make sense. And in fact, by not making sense, you're more memorable and you make more sense. Yeah, it's a liberating idea. Yeah, yeah. A lot more fun yeah. and more profitable. I, I totally agree. Didn't see it coming. The gecko, gecko, flow, progressive, and our good old IT monster. All right, now that we're aiming for fame, uh, let's move on to our next principle, which addresses uh, something related here, which is the idea of uh, reason and emotion, right? These are things that need to be balanced as well. Now, we've got this wonderful, funny uh, cartoon here, which plays on this idea of, um, are people totally rational, purely rational in B2B or just in business in general? We have this misconception that everybody's so rational in business. But let's put that to the test. Let's ask all of you at home or at work, wherever you may be, uh, to think about your everyday experience at work. Think about the decisions you see people make in your office. Do those decisions all seem perfectly rational to you? Or are there many decisions that might be not explained by ration, but instead by emotion and feeling and gut instinct? I think you'll agree that rational and emotional decision-making are both at play when at work. And as we discussed, B2B buyers are actually rational and emotional. You see that in a lot of the advertising. And so if people are rational and emotional at the same time, 
as our current experience often explains at the office. You wanna have both emotional and rational messaging in your marketing. Uh, put a really simple way, you need marketing that speaks both to the head and to the heart. Now, interestingly, in B2B, the most famous phrase in our history of B2B marketing is almost certainly this idea that nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, which I think we can all agree is at least as much as emotional as it is rational. It's probably even more emotional than it is rational. And really this just gets the idea that there's a lot of fear and doubt that B2B buyers experience when making a purchase. So this wasn't a campaign that IBM ran, uh, but people understood this idea of fair. And so IBM was wisely, as a compliment, pairing this fear idea with rational ads, like the print ad you see here on the right, which communicated the features and benefits of the IBM personal computers. Right, this sort of rational advertising gives buyers the information they need to convince themselves, and again, people that are on the buying committee with them, gives them all the information they need to say that, you know, IBM is the right choice. It's the safe choice for me. It's good for us. Here's another example we really like. It's a 14-year-old, 14-year uh, running campaign from The Economist that blends emotional and rational messaging often in the same ad itself. Now, the ad on the left is communicating a very clear emotional benefit, which is you'll achieve higher status. Whereas uh, the ad on the right is more of the rational benefit, buy it because it's good value. Uh, it's worth noting that you don't have to do one or the other. Some of the uh, best ads, in fact, blend both emotional and rational messaging in the same ad. Uh, the I never read economist ad here you can see on your left, it really does explain both those things. Like don't, you know, there's a fear that if you don't read it, uh, you won't get the right job, but it's also rationally saying do read it and you will get the right job. So it's actually blending the two together. Now you may be sitting at home or at work asking yourself, you know, how do I blend the two? How do I balance the two? And uh, we should start with a question that we introduced a while back, this idea of in-market and out-market. Uh, if a customer is in-market for a particular product or service, um, and they're actively considering different brands, then rational advertising is going to be more effective in winning the sale. And the Benetton Field research indicates that pretty clearly here. If you're about to buy car insurance, you don't want to hear from a talking gecko. Right, you already know that you're buying something. You just want to understand the prices and the packages, and you want to choose the right one. So rational messaging makes sense. If, on the other hand, the buyer is not in market, then rational advertising isn't going to be very effective. You're not going to pay attention to the nuances of different car insurance packages if you don't even have a car yet. Impossible. Emotional messages, on the other hand, uh, will be the thing you want here, because they have the advantage of being relevant and entertaining to buyers, even who are not in market, who are out market. Uh, those emotional messages are often delivered in creative stories like the Geico and the Gecko, or Flow and Progressive, or Mayhem, or We Are Farmers. Da, 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 da. Um, but in general, like these stories tend to stick in your mind for years, actually. Uh, and if you think about some of the ads I just mentioned, or the tune I just sang, you'll remember these ads often last forever. So when you're finally ready to buy, um, these ads often come to the forefront, uh, making you think of the brand and, and getting you to buy the brand. That's how emotional brand building campaigns work, in fact, to reach buyers well in advance of a purchase before they have a car, but priming them to then buy it when they, they do have a car and need to buy insurance. Um, and you've got to remember that most purchases in B2B, they're made infrequently. So most customers are not in market today, they're out market. Now that's one clear reason why emotional brand building delivers more growth over the long term uh, than lead generation does with its short term rational messaging. And that uh, you can see here from the Benetton Field data. Um, you know, ultimately, in the end, uh, you have to remember, there are many different emotions at play, and you should really focus on the emotions that are important to your category. It could be fear, confidence, curiosity. Uh, with Bennett and Field, we looked at some of the most common emotional themes that we know exist in B2B advertising, uh, and you're seeing all of them on the screen now. This is, of course, by no means an exhaustive list, but as in life and as at work, you must choose the emotions that work for you. Peter. That was such an emotional performance, John. Honestly, I'm a little choked up. You kind of remind me of uh, Meryl Streep in a lot of ways. Which role? You know, uh, probably the deer hunter. I think yeah. very evocative yeah. of that. Yeah. That was a very positive movie, just like the positive message you gave Just like gave the, the message start we're this, delivering yeah. here. Yes, yeah, yeah, very absolutely. positive. Very positive. It's like a natural thing to bring up. Uh -huh. Let's move on quickly. <laughs> We've talked a lot about creative. Now it's time to start talking about distribution and how best to target your ads which is what we're going to discuss in our next principle, which addresses the balance between customers and non-customers, perhaps our most controversial principle, so just brace yourself, okay, I warned you. At stake here is really a very fundamental question, which is how do businesses grow? Do businesses grow by acquiring new customers 
or by getting existing customers to spend more money? Should B2B marketers focus on acquisition or on loyalty and retention? According to a recent survey of ours, 65% of B2B marketers believe that focusing on loyalty is the path to growth. But is that true? The short answer is no, it's not true. I'm sorry, bummer, don't kill the messenger, but unfortunately it's not true. It turns out businesses grow by selling to more customers, not by selling more to old customers. Here, what you see here on the screen here is three different approaches to growth and targeting in B2B. You can either target your existing customers, you can target new customers, or you can target both new and existing customers with a weighting towards new customers. The data is really very clear. Hyper-targeting existing customers to increase loyalty is not what drives business growth. Acquisition strategies are much more effective, and the most effective strategy is actually just to reach both new and existing customers with a weighting towards new customers. Now with the rise of account-based marketing, maybe the hottest trend in B2B today, a lot of B2B marketers John and I meet have decided they are going to focus their efforts on a small list of high spending accounts. Ooh. What this data suggests is that B2B marketers should focus instead on breaking into new budgets and reaching as many potential accounts as possible. Yay. Yay, great, like, that's very helpful. Level. Everyone's following along yeah, much better now. Good. Now, because this is so controversial, we will point out to you, we are not the only ones saying this. Bennett and Field are not the only ones saying this. This research just confirms the findings of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute in Australia. By analyzing decades of sales data across hundreds of categories, the researchers at Ehrenberg Bass have proven pretty definitively that increasing penetration the percentage of customers who buy your brand is what ultimately drives business growth. Brand loyalty is less important, and in fact, this is a bit counterintuitive, it's actually often a function of acquisition. Loyalty is a function of acquisition. The law of double jeopardy, that's what this principle is called, what it shows is that the brands with the highest penetration also have the highest loyalty. Small brands get doubly penalized. They have less customers and less loyalty. This is true in almost every B2C category. And as you can see here, it's true in B2B categories too, like concrete suppliers and coronary stents. So if you really want higher loyalty, you should focus your efforts on acquiring more customers. Why isn't loyalty more effective at driving growth? Well, let's just think this through in common sense terms, and I would say there's three main reasons why. First of all, most customers are already spending what they can and buying what they need. And even if you can nudge those customers to buy more, the potential upside is usually much smaller than the upside of bringing on a new customer. Second of all, think for a second about the reasons why customers become disloyal. If you actually look into it, what you'll find is that a lot of the drivers of churn have nothing to do with marketing or product and sales for that matter. Churn is like a natural process. Customers retire, customers move, budget gets cut, priorities change. It happens. It just happens, guys, and it's often outside of your control. Finally, let's think for a second about the factors that influence an existing customer's decision to buy more. And let's use a B2C example here. Imagine you've never heard of Netflix, and then you see this killer ad for a great new show, like the B2B Ed show, which will be coming to Netflix soon, and you end up subscribing to the service. Now imagine a year goes by, and it's time to renew your Netflix subscription. What do you think is going to be more influential in getting you to renew? Netflix's advertising or your actual experience as a customer? the customer experience, of course. If you don't like any of the shows and you don't get any value out of the service, no amount of advertising is going to convince you to spend more with Netflix. The same holds true in B2B, right? The quality of the product and the quality of the sales support is going to have a very big influence, probably the biggest influence, on whether an existing customer spends more or spends less. And in most B2B companies, the marketing department is not in control of product or sales. That's why B2B marketers would be better off focusing on what they can control, which is the non-customer experience. Marketing drives the most growth when it's used for customer acquisition. Loyalty and retention are less important and better handled by the product and sales organization. 
And that's our edgiest principle, maybe. Time will tell. Wow. You feeling a little shooken up by that? And I know it's a lot, it's a lot. It's just hard, hard for me personally, and I'm sure hard for everybody at home and at work to understand that penetration drives loyalty. Loyalty doesn't drive penetration. Yeah. It's very different from what our mothers always told us it's growing totally up. My different. dad always said the yeah. opposite, but no. Turns My mom out. was like, if you want to retain your customers and grow your accounts, you have to, you know, focus on loyalty campaigns. Yeah, and she was wrong. Miss Lombardo was wrong. It's very sad. She's right about everything else. It's just true. Not, just it's not true. that one. Even my mom is imperfect. It's kind of hard to believe. It's a, it's a touching moment, but a difficult one. Okay, so we shall move on. We didn't even get into your funnel, by the way. You did flip the funnel there. Oh, yeah, I've forgotten the I mean, fame one. Yeah, it's I mean, a bummer. It's a bummer. You, you met the challenge, but you didn't take credit for it. Very rare, Peter. That's true, but a lot of people are going to watch this episode like 100 times yeah. on repeat, and they'll see it. That it's way. a lot of loyalty. Yeah, a lot of loyalty. A lot of loyalty. Program. Got loyal viewers. All right, let's move on to uh, our next principle, uh, which may be the most important one, uh, and it concerns the balance between broad targeting and narrow targeting. Now, uh, B2B marketers love to target narrowly. It's all about using data to hyper-target senior audiences in specific verticals, just layer upon layer upon layer of targeting. But again, we must ask, is this the uh, best approach to growth? And before we get too deep into the B2B targeting strategies, let's talk about a very obvious point, a very um, cultural point perhaps. Let's just start with an obvious comment, which is that big brands like McDonald's are big brands because they reach and sell to a lot of customers. Brands like McDonald's and Microsoft literally serve billions of customers every day. You are now eating your burgers in the cloud, people. Conversely, small brands don't have a lot of customers. That's precisely what makes them small brands. And have we seen in the, as we've seen in the previous principle, um, small and big brands grow by increasing the size of their customer bases, not by focusing on loyalty. Now the problem with narrow targeting is that most B2B decisions are made by networks of professionals, not by lone decision makers. Here's an example you can see. These are the sort of buying committees that seem to be growing more and more every year. Um, so let's say you are in the um, ad business. If you wanna drive sales today, you may need to narrowly target the marketing director or the CFO or the IT manager, the folks you see on the screen here. However, if you want to drive sales in four years, then you need to target the audiences who are going to be doing those jobs in the future. And of course, those folks are very different. You need to target the agency director today, the finance manager today, the junior IT professional today, the person who isn't the decision maker today, but who will be the decision maker in four years. Now, don't take it from me alone. Let's also trot out some of our wonderful LinkedIn data. LinkedIn data shows that every four years, 40% of LinkedIn users change their occupation, company, or industry. So there's just a lot of change, and a lot of change that frankly can't be precisely targeted and precisely controlled. Now because there's so much turnover, you do need broad targeting that reaches the folks who are gonna buy today, but also the ones that are gonna buy tomorrow. As Peter said, you wanna reach the entire category, target the whole category, not just current buyers, right? Reach everybody. Uh, but as a reminder, you shouldn't go too broad. Most people are not going to buy uh, from you, uh, you know, and so you don't want to target everybody in B2B. You need the right balance, right? So the right balance um, is going to be a little bit different. It's going to look a little bit more like this. You've got to remember simply that the vast majority of professionals are not marketing directors. They'll never become marketing directors. And so it would be inefficient to target too broadly. Really what you want is to reach everybody in the category. So we'll give you another B2C example. Uh, in B2C, you often do want to target everybody. If you're selling toothpaste, the joke around here goes, you should target everybody with teeth, except for little kids and old people who often have no teeth, sadly. Sad time. Sad, sad. sad time. Tough the to the, the food time. changes. Um, so you don't want, you know, so in B2C, you do want to reach everybody. Probably you'll use TV advertising, right? Because it's probably the most cost-effective way to reach a lot of people. However, in B2B, the economics of media look very different. Not everybody can buy cloud computing solutions. Um, and so you've just got to reach as many current and future cloud buyers as you possibly can without being too, too extravagant. So you want media channels that offer you proper segmentation and accurate reach against your category. Remember, reach is really important. You cannot influence the buyer if you don't reach the buyer. There's too much conversation about engagement and not enough conversation about reach, but it's got to be the right reach, right? It's got to reach against the category. Now, the sequence does matter and reach is always the first step in the sequence of reaching people and influencing them. This may all sound painfully obvious to you, and yet most of our clients seem determined to hyper-target and to reach as few buyers as possible. Uh. Boo. 
There are far too many conversations about micro-targeting tiny segments with laser precision. Unfortunately, this isn't science. Uh, we wish that it were, though. So, um, you know, that theory just doesn't hold up. So our research, as well as other research from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, shows that category reach is actually the single greatest predictor of growth. That means you want to reach everybody in marketing, young and old, or everybody in IT, young and old. Yet most marketers have no idea what percentage of the overall category they're reaching today. Obviously, you need to start tracking that. Uh, nor do most marketers have any sense for the share of voice they get against the ca category, and critically, how their share of voice compares to their competitors. As a general rule, way to start thinking about this is what's called the share of voice rule. And it simply means that uh, your share of voice needs to be bigger than your market share. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a 7% market share in cloud computing. Your share of voice needs to be higher than 7% in order to grow. Uh, your share of voice can be 12%, 15%, 20%. But the critical idea is you've got to be reaching more customers than you currently have in order to grow. Peter and I have said that countless times today, but it's a truth. The key metric here becomes what's called excess share of voice or ESOV, which is the difference between your share of voice and your share of market. We believe that ESOV is one of the most underrated metrics in all of marketing today. Uh, excess share of voice is really important because as I always like to say, you have to win the mind to win the market. Let's go through this in a bit more detail though, because this is an important concept and we need to put a bit of numbers uh, aside it to help you maybe make sense of it. So the Bidenfield field research shows that for every 10 points of excess share of voice, you get on average about 1% increase per annum per year in your growth in market share. Market share, just to be totally clear, simply means how many competitor, how many customers or sales you get as a percentage of the entire market. So market share means more customers. Uh, and ESOV is just as important in B2B as it is in B2C, as you can see here from the Benenfield research. It just shows that broader targeting, targeting everybody in the category is really what gives you growth. And that is really tracked as something by ESOV. Um, how broad is too broad when it comes to targeting? On B2C marketing, obviously you want broad targeting, um, but you don't necessarily need that here. So let's look at the next idea just to put it in really simple terms because the math sometimes can be complicating to people. Now, excess share of voice, let's say again, you have 7%, you wanna get a 17% share of voice, 7% market share gives you 10% ESOV, gives you your growth. This is a number everybody just sort of needs to start tracking. So that is it for my, uh, my final bit about broad and narrow. Sometimes I went broad, sometimes I went narrow. Did a little bit of both, which is honestly the right approach. And ESOV, now everybody's talking about ESOV. People told me Google search results on ESOV, they're up like 900%. Everyone's trying to calculate it. It's, great. it's already become a sensation. Aim for fame. Aim for fame. Broader and they're reach, chanting that. share of crazy. voice. What a big impact we're having. ESOV too. Okay, this is probably a good time to wrap up. We're gonna get to Q&A, but first I just wanna recap what we have learned about driving growth. And first I want to issue a public service announcement. John and I have always been saying this for about three years, but we're gonna say it again. You have to remember that growth does not occur in a vacuum, right? You are competing against other companies, and if you want to capture the most value, then you need ideas that are both right and contrarian. If you're doing what all of your competitors are doing, then you have no competitive advantage by definition, even if it's the right idea. Contrarian ideas are the most profitable ideas, an idea that's very well understood in finance. We often forget about it in marketing. Hopefully over the past 40 minutes or so, John and I have proven to you that these ideas are right. But now let me take a second to prove to you that these ideas are not just right, but contrarian based on the results of a recent survey we did of over 4,000 B2B marketers. Let's start with principle one, balancing long-term growth and short-term growth. According to Bennett and Field, brand building is the greatest driver of growth in B2B, but Crucially, you need to wait longer than six months to see the effects of brand campaigns. Now, how many marketers do you think are willing to wait six months? John, would you like to guess? Uh, 4%. Wow, that is what? incredible. You oh just nailed God. it. Only 4% of B2B marketers measure impact beyond six months, which is one of many reasons, one of many tragic reasons why B2B marketers are chronically under-investing in brand. In our second principle, personal favorite, we talked about aiming for fame. You've heard the aim for fame chant that's going on now. The need, the crucial need to bet big on bold, memorable, creative concepts. 
Unfortunately, the vast majority of B2B marketers are much too risk averse and timid to ever achieve fame. 77% of us would rather test and learn on a bunch of little small ideas than make a concentrated investment in a big idea, even though big ideas are much more likely to break through when you're in a hyper-competitive media environment. So can I say one thing? You, Of course, John. Don't just test and learn, test and learn and bet big. Yeah, yeah, fine. You That's can, a new, ad new yeah. addendum to test and learn? Yeah, but your tests need to be, they need to be big at a certain level to even have a chance of breaking through. Most things are so small that they're just guaranteed Test to and fail. learn and really bet big? Yeah, we'll workshop this. Okay, we don't okay. need to do it live on air. Well, I, just, we I want everybody to get a behind the scenes <laughs> okay, look at what's great. going on. Let's move on to our third principle where we discuss the balance between emotional and rational advertising and how effective B2B marketing needs to be both emotional and rational. But this probably won't come as any surprise. B2B marketers are about twice as likely to produce rational ads than emotional ads. Our fourth principle explained why acquisition, not loyalty, is the biggest driver of growth in B2B. Of all of our principles, this one is pretty clearly the most contrarian. Over 65% of marketers believe the opposite, that loyalty is the path to growth. Finally, we covered the importance of category reach, potentially the single greatest predictor of success in B2B. But only half of marketers believe that reach is important. Most of us prefer narrow targeting to broad targeting, even Ooh. though broad targeting is the path to future profits. Yay. Yay. All of this presents you with a massive opportunity. Again, the most profitable ideas are not just right, they're contrarian. And we believe, at least in our minds, these principles fulfill both of those requirements. And I would say as an industry, now is a good time to start exploring new models for growth and restoring balance to our marketing strategies, which is the ultimate formula for growth. I'll also have a very quick and light sales pitch for you here, which is that we do believe LinkedIn as a platform is actually designed for this new growth model, something we're going to be working on proving out in the next few years. If you as a client like these ideas and want to partner with us on executing against some of them, please reach out. Yeah, LinkedIn is the IT monster for you. Yeah, we're, we're, we'll be your IT monster. We're the IT monster for you. Uh, and now I think we have some time for Q&A, right? Yeah, let's right? do it. Let's do it. What do we got on the pod? What do we have on the pod? Well, the first question from the audience um, is, um, what do you think about uh, Byron Sharp? And Byron ideas? Sharp, great, great, yeah, absolutely. I think double law of double jeopardy, super controversial, obviously, but seems to be proven out in the data. I'm guessing the questions aren't working on the machine, and you're just kind of trying to ad lib here. Is Maybe. that what's going on? Maybe. Maybe. See, I can tell we've worked together for a very long time. But what do you think? So I think he's great. Well, I guess we can recite some of the questions we get asked a lot. Yes. So I will just play the role of the audience, John. Yeah, please. Every time we present, somebody says, you know, but how can I not be short term when Wall Street is so short term? The finance Ooh. department is short term. We got quarterly earnings. True. How can we break out of this short term trap? What would you say to me, John? I would make to you the future cash flows case for marketing. We, we talked about it earlier. We flipped the funnel from bottom of funnel, top of funnel to in market and out market. And most of the money that supports the stock price of any company actually is like 80% of that money comes 10 plus years into the future. And so if that's how Wall Street thinks about judging your company, which is mostly on your future profits, then you should think about judging your marketing or aligning your marketing to the future profits as well. And brand building is good for future profits. Sales activation is good for current profits. You need both, but the balance always needs to be tilted long-term, tilted brand building, tilted out market, tilted future cash flows. And so invest in brand building because brand building provides future cash flows. Are we doing that today though, Peter? I don't think so, but as a CFO, it really resonates with me. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to change up my whole strategy. <clears throat> yeah. What else do we get asked a lot about? Pricing power, I think, is a poorly understood concept. Yep. Should we yep. talk about that a little? We can. Um, well, I mean, I, we don't, you know, we don't have it in here, but Buffett. What did Buffett say about pricing power? Buffett, yeah. He's actually a huge fan of this show. He's probably watching right now. So Warren Buffett, crucially, he says that the number one thing to look for in a business is pricing power. Good businesses can raise their pricing without losing any customers. Bad businesses raise a 10 cents, lose everyone. I think a lot of our clients are really obsessed with this idea of volume. All they care about is driving more leads. How many leads did I get this quarter? They almost never stop 
to ask themselves what I would say is a pretty fundamental question, which is not just how many leads did I drive, but how much were those brands willing to pay for our products and services? And I think a lot of the research shows, Mark Ritson makes this point in his mini MBA program, actually increasing pricing power is often a much easier way to boost the profitability of a firm than increasing volume. Increasing yes. volume is pri uh, tough, but price, you, know, you just have to change a number, basically. You can grow the profits 10% according to some exercises. So I think marketers need to think a lot more about pricing power and the types of marketing that deliver pricing power. Would you say that's like brand building or is that more sales activation? More of a brand building mm, idea. Interesting. Why I mean, do you say that? Well, I mean, some people would say that the purpose of a brand is literally just to charge higher prices. I mean, that's a, an alternate definition to the one that we have, but it's another very reasonable one. But you want to reach people well in advance of the buying process, right? And you want them to think certain things about your, know your brand and think certain things about your brand. And often those people just buy out of convenience, not based on the cheapest price. And so if your people are buying more out of convenience or ease, then they're probably willing to pay the prices you charge. They're not looking to compare it to something else. I think we forget how many decisions um, are, are, are actually probably a little bit more ad hoc than than we realize. Mm -hmm. And in that case, brand building reaches the people. If you think it's a strong brand, you just pay the prices that they ask for. Right, that's why luxury marketers don't usually run sales activation ads. You're not gonna see a bunch of lead gen ads from Cartier. They run pure brand buildings. That's what allows you to boost your pricing power, right? Oh, love luxury, love luxury yeah, marketing. Yeah, many B2B marketers. How about this off. question? This is a, a, one of the questions we always get. Let's say that I take everything in this, in this presentation, all these principles, and I say, okay, brand's really important. Uh, I get that now, it reaches future buyers, it gives me the ability to charge higher prices, it just generates more short and long-term growth. I'm all in on, on brand marketing, uh, brand building. But you know, my colleagues who are in performance marketing or lead gen, they're able to go into the CFO and give this one number, this cost per lead. What metrics do I bring in to articulate the case or argue the case for brand marketing? What are some of the things that, that we talk a lot about that we care about? Yeah, well I think first of all, this research helps link the marketing input, which is branding, to financial performance. Yep. So I think, you know, not to sound a little too delusional here, but I think our research will help brand marketers make that case internally. Agreed. In terms of metrics you should track, we recently did sit down with Professor Jenny Ramadiak, and she made some interesting points about kind of the three key things you really need to measure to know if your brand marketing is working. She talked about category reach, which we talked about. Are you reaching all potential buyers? Yep. She talked about measuring distinctiveness, which is interesting. We said, you know, the Geico Gecko is weird. You don't mix it up with the mascots from, you know, Progressive or State Farm, right? So you need to actually measure your distinctive brand assets and make sure they're only linked yep. with your brand and not a competitor brand and that everyone has heard of you, right? So you need category reach, you need distinctiveness, and then the final piece is this idea of memory structures and owning the right neurons. This one's a little complicated, but she showed us a pretty simple tracker, I thought, where you can yeah. just say, what are what she calls category entry points? Like, what are the cues that um, lead to you buying in a category? And, and how on can that you category sure... entry point, unfortunately, I have yeah. to cut you off. Why, we're, we're done? out of time. Oh, great. Well, it would have been a great point. You would have loved it. It is great. But, but yes, category reach, well. share of voice, category entry points, all very important very ideas. Very important. Really important ideas. So um, just as a final reminder, if you liked what you learned today, uh, we'd love for you to download the report which is at b2binstitute.org. Sign up for our newsletter, which is called B2B Edge. Of course, connect with Peter and I on LinkedIn. And uh, with that, I'm John Lombardo from the B2B Institute, Peter Weinberg from the B2B Institute. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, guys. Uh, Don't forget to take our survey. We've got a survey oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Please don't, take, don't, don't, don't forget to take the survey. Thank you. Wrong camera, right survey. <laughs>